Hello, my name is Brandon, and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are new to the channel, welcome, it's great to have you. If you're a returning viewer, it's great to have you back. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with colleagues, classmates, or friends, or anyone else you think might benefit from watching. So now that we are introduced, let's go ahead and get started. So this is the second video in our series on nonlinear regression. So in the first video, we went over the basics. We had a data set, we looked at which model will be a best fit, a linear or nonlinear. We talked about R squared and standard error and mean square error and how it all plays together and of course residuals. So in this video, we're gonna go more in depth into the quadratic model. So a quadratic model is a second order polynomial where we have a squared term. So we will go a little bit more in depth, nothing crazy, a little bit more in depth about the quadratic model and why in the previous video it was the best one. And we'll also learn about some general patterns in the quadratic model. So let's go ahead and get started. So this course is brought to you by the great people at The Great Courses Plus. If you're watching this, it means you need to or want to learn something, and there are a few better places to learn anything than The Great Courses Plus. They have a library of over 10,000 video lectures spanning everything from math to philosophy to history to psychology to how to cook and do photography. So please follow the link in the description to learn about how you can get a free trial to The Great Courses Plus and of course in the process, support this channel and support them. So let's go ahead and learn more about the quadratic model and regression. So here's the example we've been using. I'll go over it very quickly. So Jack Buckley has owned a large used car lot outside Melbourne, Australia for over 30 years. As a business person, he likes to keep track of how many cars a salesperson sells per week. So Jack would like to examine the relationship between how many total cars have been sold by each salesperson, whether they work there still or not, and how many weeks each salesperson has worked for Buckley's used cars. So our goal again is to produce a model that minimizes error, but will also be good for new data we happen to throw at it. So here is our original data. So the first salesperson was there or has been there for 168 weeks and has sold 272 cars. So you can see how the data table is here on the left. And when we plot that on a scatter plot, this is what it looked like. So you can see we have, you know, obviously a person who hasn't been there as long is not going to sell as many cars. And then as a person is at the car dealership longer, they're going to sell more cars. So what we did is we created a quadratic model because it was evident in the last video that the scatter plot we just looked at, the data was not linear. Or we could say more accurately, I guess, that the best way to model this data was not with a linear model. It was actually with a quadratic model. So what we did is square our independent variable, which is weeks on the job. And that's the middle column over here on the right. So we did that and we got output and here's the output. So we have you know, a much better fit than the linear model. We have an R squared that explains almost 91% of the variance in the dependent variable, which is number of cars sold. The length of time a salesperson has been working there explains about 90% of the variance in how many cars that were sold. We have a standard error of 32.67, which was much better than the linear model. We have a mean square error of 1067 down here in the ANOVA table, which was half what it was in the linear model. And both of our coefficients were significant down here in the coefficients table in the lower left. So this was the comparison we had, linear model versus quadratic model. You can see that the red dotted line is the quadratic. It fits the data much better. We have an R squared of 0 0.9075, uh, which is about 10% higher than the 0 0.8019 over here in the linear model. So the quadratic model explained the variation better in the dependent variable. And here is our residual plot. So we have a very good residual plot with no patterns in them, no curvatures, no triangulation or anything. We have constant variance all the way across the graph, which is exactly what we want from this quadratic model. So let's talk about some general patterns in the quadratic model. So remember we have two coefficients. We have b sub one and b sub two, which is our squared term. Now as a general rule, if both of those coefficients are positive, our graph will look like this. It will be constantly going up over the range of our regression. So if both those coefficients are positive, that's in general what our graph will look like. 
Now, counter to that, if both of those coefficients are negative, well, you can guess it's going to look like this. It's going to be going down over the course of our regression. So both positive over here on the left, both negative over here on the right. Now, what about if they're not the same? What if the first coefficient, our unsquared term, is less than zero, and then our second coefficient, our squared term, is greater than zero? Well, it'll look like this. It's going to go down at first and then up as it progresses. So we're going to have like a bowl shape. So if the first term is less than zero, the second term greater than zero, our graph will be shaped kind of like a bowl. Now, a bowl has a bottom. It has a minimum. So there is going to be a minimum point in this graph, and we'll talk about that more as we go. So the only one left is where the first term is greater than zero, and the second term is less than zero. And that will look like this, sort of a hill. So it'll go up at first, peak, and then come down on the back side. And that will have a maximum at some point here on the curve. So this is our regression equation from our quadratic model. Which one of these four fits this equation? Well, it's this one. So as you can see, that our first term, 1.4095, is positive. So our b sub 1 is positive. And then our second term, b sub 2, or b2, is 0 0.0019. That's negative. So if you remember from our graph we had before, this was the general pattern. It wasn't as evident. You'll see it here in a minute wasn't as evident, but this is the way it fits. So the sign of each term in the quadratic model indicates the general shape of the data. So here's this scaled up. So remember, we have a first term that is positive and a second term that's negative. So we're gonna have this general shape. It goes up, then it goes down. Now at the top, there is gonna be a peak. And on that line, if you remember a little bit of calculus way back in the day, there will be a point along that curve where the slope of the tangent line is zero. And that is the peak of that sort of hill shape there in our graph. So how do we find where that slope is zero or the peak of the hill shape or the bottom of the bowl shape when the signs of the terms are different? Well, for me, the easiest way to find the maximum or minimum of a quadratic model is to take the derivative of the polynomial regression function. Now don't freak out, this is not that bad. If you've had calculus at any point in your life, whether it was 20 years ago like me in high school or more recently, the derivative of a polynomial like this is extremely easy. So if you need to go look it up real fast, it's actually very easy to do. So we'll take the derivative of the polynomial regression function and then set that equal to zero. This is the easiest type of derivative. So remember, when you have a curvilinear function, the derivative, the first derivative, is the slope of the tangent line. So if we take the first derivative, which is the slope of the tangent line to that curve, set it equal to zero, it will tell us sort of the peak or the bottom of that hill or bowl shape. So here is our quadratic uh, regression equation. We'll take the derivative of that, very straightforward. It's very easy. And this is what we get. So you can see that the constant over here on the left actually just goes away. The power of x sub 1 is actually 1. That becomes a constant. Flip that out. So it's just 1.4095. For the square term, we take the square. We put it out in front of the 0 0.0019. So it's times 2. And then we reduce that power by 1. So we end up with 1.4095 minus 0 0.0038 x sub 1. We set that equal to 0 to find sort of the peak of our hill, we do that, and we come up with a value for x1 of 370.92. So how can we use that? Keep that in mind. So here's our nice, beautiful scatter plot with our quadratic model laid on top of it. Looks very, very nice. So what about our 370 number we had in the previous slide? Well, that's here. So if you notice that this curve goes up and then it comes to a point between 350 and 400, and then it starts to go down again over to the right. So what we did in the previous slide is find the point in this curve where the slope of the gray line up there, the horizontal line, is zero. And that is the top of our mound shape. Even though it's kind of drawn out from what I did in the graphic, it's still the same concept. 
So what we can say is that the salesperson at Buckley's used cars maxes out their number of cars sold at around 371 weeks on the job. And then after that, for whatever reason, it begins to go down. Maybe they get too old. Maybe they get tired of being at that job or, or whatever else tends to happen. Or maybe they have other job responsibilities where they don't sell as many cars as part of their job. But, you know, 371 weeks is over seven years. So maybe that's the point at which um, they start to go downhill for one reason or another. So we can, through simple calculus, very simple calculus, find the peak or the valley of this quadratic model. This video is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus, where you can get unlimited access to over 10,000 different video lectures taught by award-winning professors from the Ivy League and other top schools around the world. You can learn about anything that interests you, science, literature, and yes, statistics, like this lecture from Professor Talithia Williams called Regression Predictions and Confidence Intervals from her course Learning Statistics, Concepts, and Applications in R. And right now, The Great Courses Plus is offering my viewers a free trial and is also now optimized for Australia and the UK. So go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Brandon Foltz, my name, to have access to the over 10,000 video lecture library or click on the link in the description below. Okay, so that wraps up our second video on nonlinear regression where we learned about quadratic model basics. So we looked at how a model is actually developed and then we looked at some general patterns of models in terms of how they look based on the two coefficients we have, b sub one and b sub two. Depending on the sign, the graph takes a definite shape. So you can actually look at your regression output and before you even graph anything, know the general shape. Then of course we learned how to find the hill or the valley of that quadratic model using, using some very simple calculus, which is pretty handy. So I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you again in our next one. Take care.